cunning folk. Okay, cunning folk. This is quite an interesting subject. There are quite a lot of books on cunning folk. Um, I am going to stick to local examples of cunning folk. So when I say local, I mean cunning folk that existed or lived near where I currently live. So the West Country, uh, the southwest of the UK. Uh, so Bristol, um, you know, Bath, the surrounding areas basically. Um, cunning folk are your kind of what you would consider to be your stereotypical witches from the, you know, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, early 20th centuries basically. Those people that lived in your community that were kind of famous for knowing magical secrets, for being able to heal, for being magical practitioners that you would go to. Yes, they probably charge you for their services, but they would be uh, kind of renowned, famous in their local communities normally appreciated but also kind of feared because at the end of the day people often do fear um, others with more power than themselves or with more knowledge than themselves. Um, we are talking about uh, you know uh, the West so when we're talking about cunning folk in the West Country the examples that I'm going to be talking about. Um, England the main religion was Catholicism, Christianity, and then later Protestant Christianity, and then Catholicism, and then Protestant, and then kind of both. So we're talking quite Christian. As such, the clients of these people would be predominantly Christian. They're pretty much all going to be Christian. Um, so the practices of cunning folk in terms of the spells that they use, you know, um, the different systems that they use, they're going to be kind of Christian looking. Whether the practitioners themselves were Christians, whether they weren't what they believed and their own personal practices outside of their professional, you know, magical work in, we don't know, have no idea, we can only guess essentially. Um, but if, much like today, uh, if a Christian person came to me and wanted a spell done or they wanted some work done, magical work, I'm going to use Christian magic, I'm going to use the Bible, I'm going to use things that they're going to be comfortable with, I'm going to use the spirits that they're comfortable with, so angels, things like that. Um, cunning folk basically almost exclusively used uh, the Bible, maybe a couple, particularly Psalms. Um, it's a lot like uh, modern hoodoo, if you think about hoodoo. Um, it has a very, very kind of Christian, it uses a lot of Christian iconography. So I'm going to go through 20 uh, of the cunning folk from various different periods of time in the local sort of region where I'm from where I live. Um, so the first is Old Mother Shipton. Uh, Old Mother Shipton, Ursula, Ursula Southall, was quite a famous one. She was a, a prophetess, clairvoyant, witch, cunning woman from the 16th century. She was born in 1488 to her mother, Agatha, who was also apparently a witch, supposedly. Um, she was born apparently in a cave by the River Nid in Narlesborough, Yorkshire. Um, there were supposedly a lot of rumours that on the night that she was born there was all of this kind of thunder and lightning and ravens croaking and all that sort of thing. I mean at the end of any good, at the beginning of any good story that kind of sets the scene. Um, unfortunately, Ursula was deformed, so when she was born, she may not have been the prettiest uh, person. Uh, so locals would refer to her as hag face or long face. Uh, the devil's child was another thing that they called her. And they kind of um, feared her from day one. Um, they, there were rumours about her being fathered by the devil, that sort of thing. Um, she was known to have quite a short temper as well. Uh, 
And the village people would say that she'd send goblins to attack people that annoyed her. Um, and the legend has it that she put a curse on the village of Silverton when its inhabitants uh, upset her. Let's be fair, she's a witch. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> um, despite her reputation, she did actually marry a carpenter who was Tony Shipton in the year 1512. Um, a lot of people were shocked at this and I would imagine there was a lot of talk uh, amongst villagers and locals as to kind of think, well, how did she get him? She must have slipped him in a love potion or something like that. Um, obviously, you know, her original name was Ursula Seifel. Um, after she married Tony Shipton, she took his name, so it was Tony Shipton. Um, uh, sorry, Old Mother Shipton was what she kind of became famous. Her famous name was Old Mother Shipton. Um, she used to foretell prophecies, so she used to tell people their futures, and she'd often use... Uh, do that in the form of poems. Um, these poems and, you know, the things she would say are were considered to be really accurate. Um, as accurate and she was probably, possibly almost as famous as Nostradamus. Um, she was famous for foretelling inventions such as iron ships, motor transport, submarines, the radio, possibly even the internet. Um, the Great Fire of London in 1666 and the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Um, Old Mother Shipton's most renowned prophecies were detailed in the earliest surviving record of her life, a pamphlet from 1641. Uh, so I am reading, as you can probably tell, I am reading this. Um, I'm not stealing it from someone else though, I did write this. This is on our Thoth Witchcraft Book of Shadows blog, uh, 50, what's it called? 50 Famous Witches and Cunning Folk. So I'm kind of plagiarizing, uh, plagiarizing myself. I will put a link to this blog in the description below, uh, so check it out. Um, the next person we have is Anne Bodenham. Um, married to a clothier, she earned a living teaching children to read and write, um, but she also claimed to be trained in the magical arts um, by famous London uh, wizard Dr Lamb. Uh, she was said that he gave her a little book of charms, whatever that means. Uh, I suppose it's kind of like a book of shadows, if it even existed, that is. Um, she probably copied some spells, incantations, that sort of thing from him. Um, in her 80s, she moved from Salisbury in Wiltshire and gained a reputation as a cunning woman. Uh, and freely told people that she had the power to cure illnesses, uh, find lost and stolen property and see the person responsible in her crystal. So kind of like a crystal ball, I would assume. Um, a woman, Anne Stiles, once reported seeing Anne Bodenham draw a circle on the ground and use a cauldron to invoke various demons called Beelzebub, Tormentor, Satan and Lucifer. Seems very Hollywood, doesn't it? Um, she was arrested and eventually sentenced to death, unfortunately, in 1653. It was noted she cursed her jailers, not for executing her, but for refusing her request for beer so that she could get drunk at the execution. Well, I suppose if you're going to die, you might as well get pissed. Um, okay, so the next person we have is Dolly Penthrath. She was born in the year 1700 and often remembered for being one of the last speakers of the old Cornish language. So that's the language from Cornwall, Cornwall area. Um, Dolly was a fish seller and had knowledge of astrology and new planetary hours to heal and to curse. So essentially kind of like a planetary magician at the end of the day. Um, one story of Dolly's reputation for cursing was the time a local man named 
Price was riding into Horstainer Road and met Dolly carrying a basket of fresh fish. He asked, he asked her to move in order for her to pass, uh, for order to, I'll start that again. He asked her to move in order to pass her by, but she refused. When he attempted to go around her, he accidentally caught her basket and split the contents all over the road. So he basically made her drop her basket of fish. Um, Price heard Dolly mumble something and knowing she was a witch, feared she was cursing him. He demanded to know what she'd said, but she merely laughed and told him uh, she had called him an ugly black toad. Mm. Well, that's putting it nicely. I'd have probably said something a bit worse. Um, insulted, Price then threatened he would horsewhip her, but Jolly just told him he could try, but that she would cast a spell that would make his arm rot and drop off. That sounds a bit more like me. Um, Price was so terrified at this, he galloped away as quick as he could before she carried out her threat. So technically she didn't perform any magic, but sometimes just the threat of doing it tends to make people, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so one of the most famous uh, was Tamsin Blight, also called the White Witch of Helston. Um, there's a fair amount that's written about Tamsin Blight actually, so you can, you know, look that up on the internet. Uh, born in Redruth in 1793, Tamsin Blight, the White Witch of Helston, was one of England's most famous cunning women. In fact, hundreds of people came to her over her lifetime for cures, charms, to have curses lifted and their fortunes told. Although it's unknown whether she originally started working as a cunning woman, so I don't know whether she actually did that throughout her whole life or maybe she had some sort of trade or what when she was younger. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. Tamsin married her first husband, of a, you know, there was more than one, uh, a stonemason called Richard Blight in 1825. They had three children, although two, die, uh, two died in 1827 within a month of each other. The third, born in 1832, survived. Richard died in 1832 from typhus, and Tam uh, Tamsin later remarried a widower named James Thomas, Jemmy, for sure. Um, Thomas also claimed to have witch powers, and the two of them kind of set up a little, quite profitable, uh, business together as cunning folk. They eventually moved to Helston in the 1840s, where they continued to do very well for themselves and always had a constant stream of visitors and clients seeking their help. The partnership, however, um, it didn't last because Thomas was apparently a perverted homosexual predator and frequently took advantage of gullible young males um, and some females, actually. Um, he would tell them that they were required to sleep with him in order to break a curse uh, that they thought they had placed on them. A scandal did eventually break when a woman from St. Ives complained about Thomas's behaviour and a warrant was issued for his arrest. Yeah, I can't say I do that with my clients. Uh, Tamsin tried to distance herself from the fallout by calling him a, brunk a drunkard, a disgraceful, beastly fellow. Uh, and recommended he be sentenced to the treadmill, which uh, treadmill was kind of like exterior steps set into two cast iron wheels. Um, it drove a shaft that would be used to mill corn, basically. Um, so kind of hard labor. Uh, uh, despite being bedridden, Tammy's continued to see clients almost up until her death when she eventually died in October 1856. She was buried in the graveyard at Helston Parish Church. And on the day of her funeral, the worst storm for generations hit the West, uh, hit West Cornwall, causing floods and turning day into night. Superstitious folk said that the devil himself had come to claim her for his own. Um, 
Thomas eventually died in 1874 and a local newspaper seemingly forgot all about the kind of sexual assaults and misdeeds and instead praised him as a charmer healer and horse whisperer. So next we have John Reed. I don't know a lot about John Reed. Uh, I know that he lived in the 17th century and was a self-educated farmer who had quite a lot of interest in the occult. He was said to have collected a lot of books on the subject of occultism, magic, um, including Agrippa's famous tome, which is a huge, massive book. I might do a video on it at one point. Um, and he would hide these books over the ditch near Mor uh, Milbourne in Dorset, where he grazed his flock. Um, not much is known about him and his practices, although he is said to have demonstrated his knowledge of the magical arts to a friend, John Cannon, who said, Reed drew a circle on the ground with a pick and inscribed some unknown characters. He then began to recite strange words in a foreign language, because there's always got to be strange words in a foreign language. Um, <laughs> Cannon said the air became strange. Sudden, suddenly charged and grew darkish and became like a mist with a jostling wind, even thunder and lightning in the distance. John Cannon was so unsettled by the experience he recommended to his in his memoirs that all such occult books be burned, because that's what we do, isn't it? When we don't understand something, we fear it, so let's burn it. Uh, okay, old James Baker. Old James Baker was a famous cunning man from Dorset who also acted as a witch finder. That is a thing that used to come up, so you'd have um, service magicians, so the good people, good magical practitioners, be brought in front of court as kind of expert witnesses to say, you know, give evidence to the fact that this other person, this magic pro magical practitioner, is a bad magical practitioner. Uh, the problem with that is that, A, how do you know that they're really an expert? I guess from reputation, but also, you know, at the end of the day, if you've got one magical practitioner saying, you know, yes, this person's a bad person, are they doing that because it's true? Or are they doing it because they don't want the competition? Anyway, uh, he was called upon by a local farmer to find who had bewitched one of his pigs. He singled out the farmer's neighbour, a lady who had just turned up at the door. Lucky, luckily for the lady, her employer later found out about this and had Baker arrested for making false accusations about her. It is unclear um, if the la lady ever did steal the pig or if Baker simply just pointed her out because she happened to knock on the door at that very precise moment. Who knows at the end of the day. So, Billy Bremner, the Wizard of the West. <laughs> uh, born in 1818 near Taunton, Somerset, uh, Billy Bremner, known locally as Billy the Piper, the Wizard of the West, uh, originally made his living from selling clay pipes, um, where he earned the name Billy the Piper. Uh, later, he opened up a grocery store in Taunton, which he used as kind of a, con a cover-up or a front for his actual business, which was the cunning man business, uh, witchcraft, magic. Um, Billy was an unusual man, often spotted wearing a cloak, a sombrero, which would have been quite weird back then, um, and a badly fitted wig. Uh, he never married or showed any interest in the opposite sex, instead uh, preferring the company of his many cats. Yeah, okay. Uh, nothing against cats, but... Uh, he earned the reputation for charging responsible rates, but would insist on visiting his clients and staying with them for, for free. Sometimes for days or even weeks, uh, they'd probably be expected to cook for him, you know, basically him up for a select amount of time. Uh, people were glad to have him though, um, as many kung folk would charge a lot of money for their servants. Um, over his career as a cunning man he had numerous brushes with the law but seems to have escaped prison on several occasions. That sounds a bit more like a wish for a cunning man, let's be fair. I don't think that many of them probably did get caught out in the end. Um, let's be fair, if you know magic, then you can use that to keep yourself out of trouble. Uh, okay, Ebenezer Weber, an astrologer in Taunton, 
um, around the 1820s. He eventually moved to Exeter and uh, uh, adopted the business name Raphael. Uh, the name appears to have been stolen though because there was a famous astrologer with the same name um, from London. So what you kind of have is you have um, Ebenezer thinking I need a magical name. I know what I'll do is I'll steal someone else's because they're more famous than me. <laughs> I don't know how often that actually happened but at the end of the day I probably put him on my kind of... Um, broad list, maybe a con man. The lines are a bit grey when it comes to cunning folk. Could they do the things they could do? Or say they could do? Could they, couldn't they? It's one of those things, isn't it? Um, George Beecham, uh, sorry, George Beecham, the Black Witch. Yes, he actually went around calling himself that, which is one thing that a lot of people don't seem to um, you know, people think that, oh, you know, when you use the term black witch, blah de blah no one likes that term, you know. Uh, this guy, George, actually went around calling himself that. So George Beecham lived during the 18th century in Winscombe in Somerset and was known as the black witch. Um, it's unsure how he earned the reputation or what kind of magical services he actually offered, but he was said to carry around a magical staff and have some secret occult book. Um, his wife uh, said he didn't want to be buried in the churchyard and instead wished to be interred in the crossroads um, so he could keep an eye on everyone, presumably. Uh, Hannah Henley. Hannah Henley lived in a hut full of cats. I don't know what it is about witches and cunning folk and cats, but you know they are quite magical creatures. Maybe I'll do a video on that. Um, sometimes around, uh, sometime around the 1840s, uh, she often wore a short petticoat and a large white apron with black satin with a black satin bonnet. Um, although she she was uh, dressed quite well, she was in fact a beggar and would visit local farms asking for bread, milk, small amounts of money, that sort of thing. Um, the farmers and locals all knew she was a witch though, so they often wouldn't refuse her, probably a bit too scared that they would, she would curse them. Um, Hannah, uh, so there was a story about her. Uh, da, da, da. Yes, so farmers and locals all knew she was a witch. Um, and there was a story about her asking a farmer, Yeah, she basically, so she did ask, uh, she knocked on the door of a local farm once, but the farmer and his wife didn't answer. It was actually the brother of the farmer who wasn't really all that aware of her reputation. Uh, maybe he was staying with them for a bit. Um, so he basically, when she said, you know, <laughs> have you got any change, have you got any bread, blah de blah, he said that he was, she should get lost or he would um, set the dogs on her. Possibly not the nicest thing you could say. Um, Hannah apparently angrily responded saying, you'll not live longer enough to use it yourself. <laughs> As if to say, you know, you better give me the bread because you know, you ain't gonna be around long enough to uh, eat it. Um, three weeks later, actually, the man died. So, you know, maybe not upset her. You can kind of see why the locals gave her what she wanted. Um, another uh, local farmer actually attested to being cursed by Hannah after um, they also refused to give her anything. Uh, in fact, when she demanded a sack of barley from one farmer and he refused, several of his horse fell sick and died mysteriously. Um, in desperation, one of her victims, another farmer, actually consulted a white witch from Chard. In, a in an attempt to bring an end to Hannah's reign of magical terror. Um, the cunning man ordered six bullock hearts to be procured and hung on a beam over the kitchen hearth. Two stuck with pins and the others with four nails, one in each. 
He told the family that as they melted in the heat of the fire, so would Hannah's heart melt until she would eventually die. Later that day, Hannah arrived at the house several times, begging for wine and spirits, saying that she was dying, but the farmer and, and his wife just turned her away. The following morning, being Good Friday, uh, the cunning man decided to take things a stage further and went to Hannah's hut in the woods to confront her, but he found her body lodged in the branches of a tree, wrapped in a white sheet um, and with a kettle by her side. Old Hannah eventually buried, uh, was eventually buried in unconsecrated ground at the crossroads near Axminster. From that day on, passing horses have been said to rear up a neigh um, at the site of her burial. It's quite interesting. Maybe she haunts the place. Um, it was rumoured that the White Witch was paid £100 for ridding the district of Old Hannah, but claimed he had earned it as she was the strongest black witch he had ever fought. Uh, okay, so we've got Maria Giles. Uh, Maria Giles, I'm not too sure about. She does come up um, as being listed as a healer in 1868, and she would charge three pounds and sixteen shillings for her services. Although she was known to charge more if she could not treat her clients, and would state that they were double witched. Maybe I'll have to use that one. Hmm. No, I'm joking. I won't really. Uh, it's not clear how successful she was as a healer. Uh, some speculate she was in fact a fraud, trying to con poor sick people out of money. I guess not a lot has been written about her, so, you know, maybe she was, maybe she wasn't, I wouldn't like to say. Uh, Liddy Shears, uh, a Romany doorstep saleswoman who lived in the early 1800s, somewhere in Wiltshire. Uh, she was rumoured to be friends with and help local poachers as there's an old story where she said where she said to have transformed herself into a hare in order to tease a certain farmer. Unfortunately for Liddy, the farmer consulted a local priest who advised him to shoot the witch with a silver bullet. The farmer took the priest's advice and shortly afterwards the witch was found dead and a silver bullet made of um, a rendered down six penny piece was found embedded in her chest. So now we've got William Salter, who was the White Witch of Bidford. Uh, William Salter, the infamous White Witch of Bidford, uh, lived in Devon in the 19th century. He was a well-known witch and so could easily find him on the wrong side of the law, which in fact he did. Uh, just not for anything related to witchcraft. The thing with William is the um, you could say about all the witchcraft trials and stuff like that, loads of people with reputations for magic getting, you know, hung and prosecuted and that sort of thing. This guy, everyone kind of knew he was a witch. Um, it wasn't that he was ever really in trouble for witchcraft. What he tended to do was he had, although he had a reputation for being a healer and a witch, and that was kind of, mm, kind of preyed upon, but necessary, he was a drinker. He was a a bit of a drunk. Um, he was actually arrested in 1846 after he was found singing and dancing in the street with several ladies of ill repute, prostitutes essentially. Um, in court uh, appearances his profession was listed as herbal doctor and white witch so he was basically taken to court for being drunken and disorderly um, and he would did actually you know it was listed on the court documents that you know he was a herb doctor or sometimes a white witch. So you kind of, it's not like everyone that's a witch was taken to court and kind of prosecuted, you know, it depends. I mean, a lot of it's opinion based anyway. So if you had some judges and that, that were like, mm, I don't really believe in witchcraft, who cares? Um, and then other people would be kind of a bit more, well, you know, let's prosecute them. Um, so Granny Boswell, Granny Boswell, she is very, very famous, um, but she came a lot later. She was the 20th century. So uh, she was brought, born of Romani or Romani lim, uh, lineage. Um, so born in Ireland. Um, her father uh, was, 
I can't say that name, Ethereum, I think it is, Ethereum Boswell. Um, he was known as the King of the Gypsies um, around the 1860s. Um, around the 1860s, she moved to Helston in Cornwall, uh, where she was regarded as a bit of a nuisance by the local authorities um, who feared that she was a, a bit of an ill wisher. Uh, one of the more famous stories of Granny Boswell uh, was when she cursed a local doctor called Taylor who was working for the Conservative Party in the in 1906, I think it was. Uh, the 1906 general election must have been. Um, this was not a politically motivated curse, um, but what actually happened was the old Granny Boswell uh, took a bit of the disliking to him. Uh, so the story goes that Dr. Taylor, who owned one of the first commercially available motor cars, so he was one of the first people to have a car, um, was reversing outside of his house when a somewhat tipsy Granny Boswell, she was a bit of a drinker as well, I can't help it, which just seemed to drink, um, who had been drinking at a local pub, stepped out in front of him. So he was reversing his car, she stepped out in front of him. Uh, the doctor in a rush uh, to co collect more conservative voters, uh, shouted at the witch to get out of the way, but she just stood transfixed at the strange, you know, she, most people back then weren't used to seeing a, a motor vehicle or car, so she was kind of like, well, what the heck is that, I guess. Plus she was drunk, so, you know, can't really blame her. Uh, Taylor, Dr. Taylor started hooting his horn, um, which kind of pissed Granny Boswell off. Um, and then she started screaming insults in Cornish at him. Uh, before striding away, she cursed the car and said it would not reach the end of the street. Uh, Dr. Taylor then drove off, but before he reached the end of the street, there was a loud bang and the car came grinding to a halt. Um, it then later had to be towed away by a horse, I think. Um, so Granny Boswell would provide charms uh, to both cunning and Romany folk, uh, notably a small curative bag of black spiders, well I don't like spiders, and was consulted by girls and young women on the matters of love. Uh, she was also known to be skilled in the curing of cattle. You'll see a lot of that cunning folk um, would be called in kind of as vets. Um, to deal with uh, sick cattle because at the end of the day, you know, farming was a big thing, especially because we're talking the West Country as well. So there's lots of farms, farmers. Um, farming would be a really, really big thing. And if a couple of your livestock died, that was your income for the year at the end of the day. Uh, Granny Boswell eventually died in Helston, in the Helston workhouse actually, at the age of 96. Uh, on the 16th of April 1909. Her coffin was taken in a horse-drawn hearse to a gypsy enclosure in New Mill outside Penzance, where her body uh, remained in tent until the day of her funeral. Uh, Romanies from near and far came to pay their respects and camped on the roadside. She is buried in a small churchyard in Trigest. Yeah, I think it's Trigest. So the next one we have is Vixana, who's the Witch of Vixen Tor. So now we're getting into more, um, not necessarily, we can't trace back whether they're actual people. They're more kind of like um, folk tales. Um, so the Witch of Vixen Tor was supposedly an evil witch. Uh, said to leave deep, uh, live deep within the Tor on Dartmoor, uh, in Dartmoor. Um, the Tor is actually now named Vixen Tor after her. Um, she was said to, to trick passing wayfarers by magically creating a mist so she, they would become lost and end up in a nearby bog as sacrifices to Vixana's Dark Master. It makes me kind of think that maybe she's not necessarily a thing, it's just kind of a local, um, kind of like the Witch of Wookie Hall, maybe it's a local thing that's just dreamt up to stare, scare kids. Um, who knows, she might have existed, I don't know. Um, legend has it, uh, he, let's see, yeah, legend has it, uh, he tried this, 
Yeah, legend had it that she tried to do that to a local Moor man, uh, who was in fact a skilled magical practitioner, so she tried to trick another witch, basically. Uh, the cunning man turned himself invisible using a magic ring and crept up behind her, pushing her over the edge of the tor to her death. Vixana Tor has a reputation for witchcraft to this day, so you'll get that a lot where there's kind of sites that, I mean, think about Salem in Massachusetts, you've got a site that maybe had witchcraft, maybe didn't have witchcraft, but just because it's got a reputation for witchcraft, loads of modern day witches flock and do things there and want to visit, that sort of thing. So Vixen Tor is one of those places where uh, a lot of modern rituals take place in secret. Who these people are that go there, what they do, who knows, could be kids messing around with a Buckland's book or it could be serious medical practitioners, who knows. So the Witch of Zenner, uh, known by locals and her clients as Ang Aunt Margaret or Maggie, uh, the Witch of Zenner was rumoured to have descended from an old aristoc uh, aristocratic family who'd fallen on hard times. Uh, she, worn f she wore fine clothes on special occasions such as a blue silk dress and quilted petticoat of an expensive antique variety. Um, she had a tumble-down cottage furnished with high oak chairs, shelves, and lined with rare fine china and a spinning wheel. Wow, I don't know that many witches. Actually, I do know a witch with a spinning wheel, funnily enough. Um, she mainly made her living from knitting, weaving, and spinning, but also sold herdal, uh, herbal cordials and honey from her beehives. Uh, she was also, though, rumoured to be friends with local smugglers and let them hide the contraband in her cottage so that they wouldn't be kind of uh, banged out by the local law. That does sound very witchy. I know a lot of witches that would do that, definitely, especially for a cut. Um, cut of the prophets. Um, she was well known as a healer who could lift curses and made wax images of ill-wishers to punish them. But one day Maggie faced the wrath of some locals who had been stirred up by a local farmer who was accusing her of ill-wishing his ducks. Luckily for Maggie, her trusty wooden rack above her hearth, above the fireplace, uh, warned her of this. How, I don't know. Maybe it talks, I don't know. Um, Armed with a rusty iron-headed conjuring stick, I can just imagine that, um, and two loaded horse pistols, so she's got a magic stick and two guns. Um, two young men and a girl later knocked on the door and accused Maggie, uh, Maggie of being a black witch and of giving the girl fit. In reply, she pointed the pistols at them and threatened to shoot them if they didn't go away. Uh, the men, of course, quickly left. Uh, fair play. I mean, you don't have to use magic to fix all your problems. Sometimes a gun will do, I guess. Um, so next we have Old Mother Hearn. Old Mother Hearn was a small woman, often described as being shabby or dirty. She lived in a small thatched cottage on Dead Man's Hill near Cherton in Dorset but never paid rent as her landlord was far too scared to actually charge it or ask for it. Uh, she would tell your fortune, but only if you crossed her palms with silver. Oh, how stereotypical, but then these things come from somewhere, don't they? Um, it said after she died and people came to pay their respects that her corpse sat bolt upright in the coffin and uttered prophetic words. What those prophetic words were, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so we've got a man, the wise man, who was just called Snow. Um, Snow the wise man was apparently a wise witch. He used to travel the road between Ex Exeter and Oakenhampton um, every week to meet his clients in the, in the Oakenhampton market. He sold a wide range of charms and herbal remedies and many people from Oakenhampton also travelled to Exeter for a one-to-one -one session. Um, so you'd get quite a lot of people, you know, they didn't really have psychic fairs, they just have actual farmers markets and that sort of thing. So you might have a reader or, you know, famous person like that might travel between a couple of them. Um, back then they didn't really have supermarkets and that, so you would get a lot of your produce, uh, your fruit and veg and that if you're not growing it yourself. 
you'd buy it from the butcher or the grocer or the wait for the local farmers market um, so old wise man snow was described by by a client as being a wise and good man um, and he told his clients uh, you were, yeah basically what he told his clients was always good so I don't know whether that's kind of like the modern say day psychic that just makes a reputation for telling people what they want to hear. I don't know. I'm not saying all psychics do that, but on some of these hotlines, you know. Check out the uh, Psychic Hotlines Exposed video. Uh, the Wish of Wookie Hole. Now, that's a famous one around here. Um, so for those of you who don't know about the Witch of Wookie Hole, um, the Wish of Wookie Hole is probably uh, more of a legend than a real life witch. Um, but I'm going to include her in this list anyway. Um, so basically there's a, a, a cave called Wookie Hole Cave, massive cave um, in the West Country just outside Cheddar. Um, and during the excavation of the cave in 1912, a 1,000 year old skeleton of a female was discovered along with two goats, a dagger, a milking pot, an iron pod and a key. The legend goes that a man from Glastonbury was engaged to a girl from Wookiee. A witch living in the Wookiee Hole Caves curses the romance so that it fails. The man, now a monk, he eventually grows up to be a monk. I guess he couldn't find love. Uh, seeks revenge on this witch who, uh, having been jilted herself, frequently spoils budding relationships. So basically, she has had problems with love, so she basically curses other people so that they can fall in love. Okay. Um, the monk stalks the witch into the cave and she hides in the dark corner near one of the underground rivers. The monk, yeah, it's actually got underground rivers. Um, anyone visiting the West Country should definitely go to Wookie Hole. They do tours around it. Uh, the monk blessed the water and splashed some of it on the dark parts of the cave where the witch was hiding. The blessed water, so holy water, um, touched the witch and Im immediately petrified the witch, turning her apparently into a, a rock. Um, the witch also had a dog and the dog um, was also with the witch in the cave. So when the water splashed the dog, the dog also apparently um, turned to stone. So when you go in Wookie Hole Caves now on the tour, they will point to this big rock a stalagmite basically it is um, and it kind of looks a little bit like a person and a face and they basically just point to it and say look there's the witch and there's a little one um, next to it which they say look there's the dog that's basically apart from the skeleton and finding stuff which you know I don't know whether that proves that there was a witch there or what um, yeah it's just kind of a local story really so there you have, I've gone through uh, 20 famous witches and cunning folk from the West Country, from the surrounding areas. Um, they all are older practitioners. We do still have cunning folk. Technically, I'm one of them um, around here. Um, and again, it's just the profession of magic. A lot of the time, you know, some people live in the city, some people live in rural locations, but it is just people that just get this reputation for um, their magical ability. So, so people just seek them out. And some people do it part-time, some people do it full-time. It's just one of those things. It is a career, um, the career of magic is a lot of it's basically cunning folk that is what they did um but yeah there we go so that's the cunning folk video